from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. American poetry. Whatever it is, it must have a stomach that can digest rubber, coal, uranium, moons, poems. Like the shark, it contains a shoe. It must swim for miles through the desert, uttering cries that are almost human. The Library of Congress and WETA present two American poets, James Wright and Lewis Simpson, reading and discussing their poetry. The moderator is James Dickey, consultant in poetry to the Library of Congress. We are here with two American poets, Lewis Simpson and James Wright. Mr. Simpson was born in Jamaica in the British West Indies in 1923, educated in this country at Columbia, and now teaches at the University of California at Berkeley. Uh, he is uh, the author of uh, several books of poems, The Arivistes, Good News of Death, A Dream of Governors, and At the End of the Open Road, which won the Pulitzer Prize for 1963. Uh, a new volume called Selected Poems was issued last year. Mr. James Wright was born in Martins Ferry, Ohio, in 1927. He graduated from Kenyon College and did graduate work at the University of Washington in Seattle. He is the author of three books of verse, The Green Wall, St. Judas, and The Branch Will Not Break. Uh, these two poets approach the situation of being American poets very differently, as they should. A story about chicken soup. In my grandmother's house, there was always chicken soup and talk of the old country, mud and boards, poverty, the snow falling down the necks of lovers. Now and then, out of her savings, she sent them a dowry. Imagine the rice powdered faces and the smell of the bride like chicken soup. But the Germans killed them. I know it's in bad taste to say it, but it's true. The Germans killed them all. In the ruins of Berchtesgaden, a child with yellow hair ran out of a doorway. A German girl child, cuckoo, all skin and bones, not even enough to make chicken soup. She sat by the stream and smiled. Then, as we splashed in the sun, she laughed at us. We had killed her mechanical brothers, so we forgave her. The sun is shining. The shadows of the lovers have disappeared. They are all eyes. They have some demand on me. They want me to be more serious than I want to be. They want me to stick in their mud hole where no one is elegant. They want me to wear old clothes. They want me to be poor, to sleep in a room with many others, not to walk in the painted sunshine to a summer house, but to live in the tragic world forever. Louis, I want to ask if that poem is about America. Well, it is about an American experience, which I don't think we have absorbed. That is uh, World War II. It's part of our psyche, especially uh, part of the, the psyche of, of people who are interested in what happened to the Jews. This is a shock and a thing that has not yet been absorbed. Um, that is American in that sense. But it is not just American. I think it's about uh, death and... Well, all right. And that, that's fair enough. I keep thinking about the phrase, uh, to live in the tragic, they want me to live in the tragic world forever. There was a remark by Randall Jarrell that I thought was uh, interesting, and I don't know if I've ever quite absorbed it. He said that we, we, we have a, a, uh, uh, an attempt to, to 
create a Native American poetry, by which I suppose he means we have an attempt on the part of uh, uh, our own imagination to come to terms with our real life. But he said that the farther back we get, that is, the closer, say it, in the American past, uh, the closer to the, to the, the American past uh, we become, the, uh, the more we find uh, Europe coming up. Mm, indeed. That was a strange... Well, they wouldn't agree with this in California, where I am. They wouldn't agree with it in California. No. Uh, uh, some of the poets there feel very much more strongly that they're turning to the East. Um, and that's where they, their real connections are. When in you fact, say the East, you mean the Orient. The Orient, yes. Orient. Um, I agree. I think America is becoming more European in some respects rather than less in the tragic sense. What I like so much about that poem, Louis, uh, is that it, it seems to me to be a very eloquent variation on the no man is an island idea. Uh, that, uh, that, that, and there is a kind of feeling, an uneasy but very pervasive feeling among people in, in say, countries like America, who are, which are affluent and so on, that they have bought their affluence at the price of somebody else's suffering, that we cannot, we cannot simply uh, walk in the painted sunshine. Uh, we are in some mysterious way, whether we like it or not, and usually we don't, connected with things that have happened before in other places that we have never seen. Isn't that what you mean? Yes, and uh, you see, I don't think that a feeling is something that you, you want. It's something that you uh, have to have. Absolutely. Uh, I, I don't want to feel, <laughs> I don't want to feel tragic. No, it, no. You know, no. no, this no. Is, these are things that are forced upon you. Sure. I find this very, very moving poem, and I asked the question, first of all, uh, is, is that an American poem or a European one? It seemed to me, uh, that uh, it, it, that's, it, it's intensely American in the very best sense that I know of. The, the American writers and the American thinkers that I do respect are the ones who have wakened out of this, uh, this sort of daydream that we've had about kind of, the mm, noble savage and all this kind of thing. A kind of spiritual isolationism. Uh, so that you're mentioning Berchtesgaden in it is something like uh, so many American writers, and not only in war, you see, you have gone to Europe to discover. You, uh, have, you two have an advantage I don't have. Uh, you were born here, and many things are American to you uh, that, that you don't even recognize. And uh, you've been yeah. through processes I never went through, and I had to try intellectually to get at it. Uh, there are things, for example, in your poems, It's a Jim, passion, though. I your poems about the, the losers, of, I, I, I think of them, are very American in a way I don't understand these people the way you do. Uh, could we read? Uh, please, do you think, Jim, please. Go ahead. You? Why don't you read the one on President Harding? The two scenes, yes. The two poems on President Harding. Two poems about President Harding. First, his death. In Marion, the honey locust trees are falling. Everybody in town remembers the white hair, the campaign of a lost summer, the front porch open to the public, and the vaguely stunned smile of a lucky man. Neighbor, I want to be helpful, he said once. Later, you think I'm honest, don't you? Weeping drunk. I am drunk this evening in 1961 in a jag for my countryman, who died of crab meat on the way back from Alaska. Everyone knows that joke. How many honey locusts have fallen, pitched root long into the open graves of strip mines, since the First World War ended, and Wilson the gaunt deacon jogged sullenly into silence. Tonight, the cancerous ghosts of old con men shed their leaves. For a proud man lost between the turnpike near Cleveland and the chiropractor's signs looming among dead mulberry trees, there is no place left to go but home. Warren lacks mentality, one of his friends said. Yet he was beautiful. He was the snowfall turned to white stallions standing still 
under dark elm trees. He died in public. He claimed the secret right to be ashamed. And second, his tomb in Ohio. The epigraph, H.L. Mencken's remark on William Jennings Bryan, he died of a busted gut. A hundred slag piles north of us, at the mercy of the moon and rain, he lies in his ridiculous tomb, our fellow citizen. No, I have never seen that place where many shadows of faceless thieves chuckle and stumble and embrace on beer cans, stogie butts, and graves. One holiday, one rainy week, after the country fell apart, Hoover and Coolidge came to speak and snivel about his broken heart. His grave, a huge absurdity, embarrassed cops and visitors. Hoover and Coolidge crept away by night, and women closed their doors. Now junk men call their children in. Before they catch their death of cold, young lovers let the moon begin its quick spring, and the day grows old. The mean one-legger who rakes up leaves has chased the loafers out of the park. Minigan Leonard half believes in God, and the pool room goes dark. America goes on, goes on, laughing, and Harding was a fool. Even his big pretentious stone lays him bare to ridicule. I know it, but don't look at me. By God, I didn't start this mess. Whatever moon and rain may be, the hearts of men are merciless. The question I have is, uh, I think I understand that poem. It's, it's about innocence, uh, in a sense. This is what you love about Harding, uh, who seems so very unlovable to me. Yes. Uh, but it is innocence. And uh, the other thing I want to bring up, though, is is question of rhythm, because I believe that, that this is what makes a poet. I think that at the middle of a poet is a sense of rhythm, and this is more important if you can put one thing first and nothing second. I think this is the quality that makes poetry. And you have two completely different rhythms in that one poem. One is what I suppose you'd call free verse, and the other is a very powerful, what is it, a tetrameter or is it a the trimeter? Te tetrameter. Beat. Um, how do you feel about this question of rhythm as a poet? Uh, is this essential to you, Jim? Is it? Absolutely. Poetry uh, comes to me, first of all, through, through its sound, and yeah. sound also implies the, the development of a thing, too. I wanted to have, a, in, in this poem, to have a very, very formal and dignified uh, rhythm, if I could get it, to, uh, uh, to try to, uh, to show my respect uh, for Harding. The poem isn't simply about Harding. Of course, it's about uh, 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 Americans who are caught in some kind of dream and are suddenly thrust into reality. And uh, he, he, he couldn't take it. All right, but uh, not very many Americans have been able, have, uh, to take it. But I want to do, uh, to have a formal rhythm to express my my feeling about uh, his dignity. Jim, and I didn't want it to uh, be pitying him. Mm. It's not exactly that. No, it isn't exactly. But what uh, surely one does feel uh, pity for Harding. There is there is a there is a, a a kind of paradox of this very beautiful, handsome, classic featured person, uh, who looks like. Uh, almost anyone's ideal of a successful man and a, and a leader of nations, a leader of men, who is actually a tool of the machines, a pathetic tool of the political machines, and is broken as a human being uh, by this kind of dichotomy yes. uh, between, between what he seems to be and what he really is. This seems to me to, 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 to say some very powerful and effective things about American life. Uh, there is, in your poems, and I think this is the thing that really gives them their, their motive power and their drive, Jim, uh, an understanding uh, of, of, of failure. The only, the only other American poet that has, has anything comparable to it, in my opinion, is Edwin Arlington Robinson, who approaches the, the subject of human failure from a different standpoint. Uh, these... these, uh, these uh, are, are, are things that you are writing about are lives which have been broken, uh, partly by their own inner inadequacies and and uh, and uh, subterfuges and self delusions, but also partly by another thing, 
What is this other thing? Is it some quality of American life that allows this, this, this to happen, or maybe even worse, or forces it to happen? I think that it's even more difficult than this, Jim. I think that the other thing is something that uh, uh, moves me also. Uh, we were talking, I, I mentioned Edmund Burke's remark, that to make us love our country, our country ought to be lovely. And there is some kind of, uh, 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 of effort on our part to be comely before the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, 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 and this, this is a, a worthy thing, only we, we seem to be trying it uh, so far in, in all the wrong ways. We talk merely about our, our image, but uh, we, ha we haven't achieved our, 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 our true dignity. I'm thinking that, you know... Um, and yet we fail because we, we were going in the wrong direction. I don't know. Americans, uh, as, you t as we're talking here now, you know, you'd think that when we sat down to write poetry, we thought about being Americans, uh, which is not really true. Um, and I'm thinking that um, a man like Hardy, for example, is a very English poet. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine a more English poet. And I'm trying to think of a poem of his now in which the word England appears, apart from the, the long poem, The Dinas, or something like that. He's a man who writes about birds, he writes about people, he writes about landscape, and, and this is the way you are an American. But I think maybe there's something in our um, being American, we always have a feeling that we have to have a personal relationship with the country as a whole, which is a very strange thing. Maybe this is what being an American is, this illusion. It's an abstraction, too. It's an abstraction, but um, I, lately, you know, I, 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 I don't want to do this. I want to uh, write about particular things so well that they would become mm. interesting to a lot of people. I'm sure this is true of you, too. Sure, the business of being a, 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 an American poet would then devolve into the, in, as, as, a, as a writing problem, into your rendering the American experience as you live it so vividly uh, that, that it, it would become, if one wanted to see this in it, an American poem thereby, yep. but not through any overt uh, and sort of external Americanism. Oh, ab absolutely, surely, surely this is true. If it isn't, it should be. I have the feeling there are all sorts of things uh, hovering in the air that we, we live with and so on, and we don't write poems about. Now, I want to ask you a question about that poem. You had certain things you felt, but you dramatized it. You, you put it on to Hardy. Now, this seems to me to be not the typical operation today among many poets. You know, today we live in a period when sincerity is the word, sincerity is the rage. You just come directly out and you pour in a lyric outpouring your own to things directly at the audience, and uh, confessional poetry, I call it. And, um, but you, you go through a different thing. You put an object in between yourself and the, and the man listening, a, a character, Harding. And um, this is, uh, I think, a not too fashionable way of doing it nowadays. Do you feel this, or no? I think that you're right, and uh, 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 I'm... Uh tired of that, that confession, uh, confessional sort of poetry. I think that this is essentially dramatic. Uh, it's a dramatic gesture, it's a dramatic device. I, I tend to the poem isn't about uh, Harding, the poem is about myself. Mm -hmm. I tend to distrust uh, sincerity when it comes directly at me. I'm not so sure it's, it's so sincere. When it declares it is. Yes, and when it says, I'm going to tell you the whole truth oh, that's about that, myself. That, like that New York remark that Jim hates. So what is that? Uh, mm -hmm. I'm being uh, uh, completely frank. I'm going to be completely frank with you. Oh, yeah. Yes, I'm going I'm I'm to be... I'm going to be honest with you. When anybody tells you that, you know that he isn't. Yeah, count your spoons. Then. Yeah, right. But you see, right. I think a lot of the younger people I know who write poetry do not understand the creation of an object between the poet and that and the audience a kind of a dramatic fiction you no know. they don't uh, they think it's a it's, it's a dishonest thing to create fiction and i think it's an attack on the imagination i think it's a puritanism which is a direct attack upon the greatest thing i think poetry has besides rhythm is imagination is to create a world which is not the world we see around us or even directly feel ourselves it seems to me that that uh, i know from my own personal experience the poets I like the best are the, are the ones that create the most superb lies. Uh, yes. Uh, I remember a remark that I once read attributed to Pablo Picasso, who said, uh, art is a lie which makes us see the truth. Uh, it's not so much the truth of it that I care for, it's the, it's the magnificent creation of a, of a, of a personal mythos. 
uh, as, 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 as uh, the, the great artist. Nietzsche said, for example, uh, that no true artist would tolerate for one minute the world as it is. <laughs> he wants to make it like he wants it. <laughs> Speaking about people who create a personal mythos, and also about uh, this, this whole problem. Louis, couldn't we hear that poem of yours, the, the Walt Whitman? This bears directly on what yes. we've been talking It's right at the heart of it, I think. Very much so. Walt Whitman at Bear Mountain. There's an epigraph from Gasset. Life which does not give the preference to any other life of any previous period, which therefore prefers its own existence. Neither on horseback nor seated, but like himself, Squarely on two feet, the poet of death and lilacs loafs by the footpath. Even the bronze looks alive where it is folded like cloth, and he seems friendly. Where is the Mississippi panorama and the girl who played the piano? Where are you, Walt? The open road goes to the used car lot. Where is the nation you promised? These houses built of wood sustain colossal snows, and the light above the street is sick to death. As for the people, see how they neglect you. Only a poet pauses to read the inscription. I am here, he answered. It seems you have found me out. Yet, did I not warn you that it was myself I advertised? Were my words not sufficiently plain? I gave no prescriptions. And those who have taken my moods for prophecies mistake the matter. Then, vastly amused, why do you reproach me? I freely confess I am wholly disreputable, yet I am happy because you have found me out. A crocodile in wrinkled metal loafing. Then all the realtors, pickpockets, salesmen, and the actors performing official scenarios turned a deaf ear, for they had contracted American dreams. But the man who keeps a store on a lonely road, and the housewife who knows she's dumb, and the earth are relieved. All that grave weight of America canceled, like Greece and Rome, the future in ruins, the castles, the prisons, the cathedrals unbuilding, and roses blossoming from the stones that are not there. The clouds are lifting from the high Sierras, the bay mists clearing, and the angel in the gate, the flowering plum, dances like Italy, imagining red. I was trying to say something there that I, I don't think was a reflection <coughs> of anything I had seen. It's true, I had a, a tree outside my gate, you know, that was a color of red I could never have imagined, you know. And, that, and, and I thought, how wonderful if we could write poems that would present things that, that there are no patterns for uh, in this world. Mm. Louis, uh, I, if, if you don't mind my, my comment on, on this <coughs> from a purely personal standpoint, I have read so many, so many accounts uh, of, of uh, the failure of Whitman's dream for America uh, uh, that, that uh, I'm not ins insensitive to, uh, to certain implications of the poem. Uh, many people have said uh, that the 19th century uh, in which Whitman wrote and which it was possible for him to believe as he did about the, about the fine uh, future where everybody would be comrades uh, and uh, raise up a, a, an enormous nation uh, of, 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 of free, uh, well, free intercourse and f intellectual and physical uh, out, out of a new virgin land to create a new heaven and a new earth, as D.H. Lawrence had said. That, uh, th these commentators say that somewhere along the line this began to deteriorate and we, we ended up with what we have. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, this, your poem is about this in, in, in some way or another. Uh, it, it seems to me uh, that, that, that uh, the poem that you write as an American poet in the 1960s, taking Walt Whitman as an example uh, of, the, of, the, of both the statement of the dream, which he did magnificently, and the, the sordid reality of the realtors and the used car lots and so on, 
uh, is, is getting pretty much to the heart of the point of saying something real about our country, where we do live and how it got to be the way it is. Well, this, I think, ties in what we were talking about before. Uh, Whitman had this great merging, you know, which I agree with Lawrence. I wouldn't want to, I don't want to merge. I don't want to stay away, Walt, he says. I don't want you merging with me. Yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, uh, you know, the way Lawrence puts it. Now, I think there were two Whitmans who were quite different. One was an avant-garde man who was of, of very complicated sensibility mm -hmm. and who was not a uh, regular <laughs> Joe by any means, mm -hmm. which I don't think any artist ever is, a uh, real artist. And he, uh, when, that's what I was trying to say here, he was advertising myself, mm -hmm. himself, his essential self. Then there's another Walt who's very much the product of the pre-Civil War or that period, who feels the march of progress. And the second Walt to me as a prophet is dead. I don't see that march of progress in mm -hmm. any meaningful emotional sense. It's dead to me. But the Walt Whitman, who's an individualist, that's different. Let, let, let us read one more and, uh, uh, of Mr. Wright's and to comment if we have a chance. Would you read the one called A Blessing, Jim? Yes. It's a particular favorite of mine. A Blessing. Just off the highway to Rochester, Minnesota, twilight bounds softly forth on the grass, and the eyes of those two Indian ponies darken with kindness. They have come gladly out of the willows to welcome my friend and me. We step over the barbed wire into the pasture where they have been grazing all day alone. They ripple tensely they can hardly contain their happiness that we have come. They bow shyly as wet swans. They love each other. There is no loneliness like theirs. At home once more, they begin munching the young tufts of spring in the darkness. I would like to hold the slenderer one in my arms, for she has walked over to me and nuzzled my left hand. She is black and white, her mane falls wild on her forehead, and the light breeze moves me to caress her long ear that is delicate as the skin over a girl's wrist. Suddenly I realize that if I stepped out of my body, I would break into blossom. I think, Jim, uh, this poem, which has to do with a simple moment simply walking into a field and with horses and caressing one of them. It brings us back to a, a reality that American poetry needs as well as any other poetry, simply the reality of the personal, physical moment. Yes, of course, uh, I don't think this is, again, a very fashionable point of view, but I agree with it. American poetry, whatever it is, it must have a stomach that can digest rubber, coal, uranium, moons, poems. Like the shark, it contains a shoe. It must swim for miles through the desert, uttering cries that are almost human. Thank you very much for being with us, gentlemen, Mr. Sampson, Mr. Wright. It was a good, I think, a fortunate time. Two American Poets, featuring James Wright and Lewis Simpson, has been presented under the auspices of the Gertrude Clark Whithall Poetry and Literature Fund, in cooperation with the Library of Congress. This has been a WETA Cultural Affairs Special. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.